joining us joining us today. Could you just tell us a bit about who you are and where you're from? <clears throat> well, I'm uh, the groundsman at a little cricket club called Bridge Home CC, which is up in West Yorkshire, right on the border with Yorkshire and Lancashire. Uh, it's a small club founded in the early 50s, uh, playing in the Halifax Cricket League, which is a relatively well-respected cricket league in England now. Um, started off as a workshop team from two mills and then eventually grew up into an open access team for uh, all locals and lads from far and wide, whoever wants to, to, to play in this travel, to prepare to travel the distance to get here. So usually it's generally locals, all born and bred lads like myself. Uh, and we're uh, a reasonably sized team, two teams playing every Saturday, Sunday. Used to have a Sunday team, but numbers dwindled on that. Um, so we're back down to two. Uh, just playing cup games on Sundays if we're in there, and you know, as long as we last. Uh, and generally, just en enjoying cricket like everybody else is out there, really. But uh, a nice small, small ground. Uh, one of the smallest in the Halifax League, uh, but it's a beautiful ground, and uh, its size means that you you feel so much involved in the game as a spectator. I've been to a lot of grounds that are very large when I've been following my son around to different when he's a junior to big clubs in Manchester and this lot and you just walk around the boundary edge and you don't feel like you're part of the game it's a, everything, all the action's so far away but here we have a we, we have a lovely little situ with a river river colder on one side we have a, a road to the other side but the road's elevated so you get like an embankment and you can just look from the road down over the ground, which gives you this lovely amphitheatre type, type view with the views up to the, to the hillside and the moors and the Studley Pike Monument uh, right in the distance. So it's very picturesque, very panoramic. And uh, over the last seven years, we've, we've turned it around from just being just a, a field more into a, a nice place to visit, very floral. Lots of flowers, lots of little seating areas, lots of little things going on. So when the players and spectators do the little ambles around the ground and they, you generally just walk around a bit, sit down, watch for a bit, move around a bit more, sit down, watch for a bit. You get a different aspect all the way around. But there's always plenty of places to sit and see, see things going on from, from, from a rel relatively very close aspect. You need to keep your eye on the ball, really. If it's that smaller ground. Uh, but uh, very, very much... Uh, Likes ground, I believe. Spend a lot of time there. Obviously, you just uh, live next to it. Yeah, I live right next to the ground. I can I can virtually spit out of my window onto the field. Uh, they they call it my garden, mm -hmm. um, and it, it pretty much is really. Uh, I spend well, I'm going there every day. Not always doing some, but after every day, I, I'm always planning and thinking and sizing things up and thinking what I'm going to be doing next and prepping and thinking where you need to be in your schedule for your work, for your ground, or your winter work, or your summer work, your pre-season, your prep work, your next track, your, your, your repair work. Uh, <clears throat> there's always something, as a groundsman, any groundsman, they never switch off. You've got to be up there, you've got to be thinking like when's, when, when's the weather going to be right to do this job? Do I need to get this in? I need to get a mower sorted before I start this job. And it's all scheduling and thinking and planning. Um, and you, at the same time, you've got to try and think about moving forward as well. The, the, up, the upkeep is, is a big major play. But uh, at the same time, you want to be trying to be moving forward. So you've always got to be thinking about that. Well, what can we do to improve this? What can we do to make that so that doesn't, go wrong again or we don't have to maintain it again can we do it in a different fashion so you don't need repairing next time build a, a stone wall instead of a wooden fence and things like that so you you're always on the go and always thinking you've had some major flooding issues there <clears throat> uh flooding's always been an issue here being right next to the river calder and being very low down um we'll get flooded three four times a, a year but it's not not serious floods. It looks flooded, so you look over the ground and you can't see the ground because it's full of water. Water's not a big problem in itself, really. Uh, a big flood to me is when it breaches 
the river wall that we now have um, and comes down directly because it brings all the sand, the silt, the rubbish, the debris, all the things that you don't want, the little stones, the li all the things that you do not want on a cricket field that are detrimental to the, the mowers, the plain surface. It's, it's horrible. And then and the processes of, of getting rid of all this stuff also always causes damage because it's, it's so difficult to do. So yeah, we've uh, we've had a few recently. We've had the what I thought was we had a very serious one in 2015, the Boxing Day flood, where it took out the perimeter wall quite a bit and breached. And we had all the sand, the silt. It took weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. Uh, and there were probably something like 30, 40, 50 tons of debris that we had to shift. Wow. Sand. Rubble, silt, everything, wow. just Incredible. all gone. Mm. And then, then this, so say last year in February, it did it again, but, but to an even greater extent, it managed to, even though we'd rebuilt all the walls and they were stronger, it flattened them. I mean, you had 20 yards worth of uh, concrete filled uh, nine inch hollow block five courses high, 20 yards long, just flattened. Uh, rubble all over the field, uh, devastation, the sand and the silt as well. So we had no, no flood defences whatsoever. And then we did have the, the little flood that came just slightly afterwards as well, but a few days later, uh, which breached again. But I think probably the fact, the fact that the river had already done it once meant that there wasn't a great deal of sand and silt in the base of the river to be lifted and shoved on. So all we got really was water. So it just set us back a bit. It didn't, it didn't, it didn't bring any additionals. It just set us back a bit. So we, and we hadn't actually started doing any work because, it, quite frankly, it was that serious and that bad. We didn't know whether we would continue as a cricket club. We didn't, I didn't envisage anybody wanting to put their hand in the pocket to to, to, to do the job or pay for it. We're only a little club. We don't have big funding. We run hand to mouth, very much so. You know, I, I'll only spend our outgoings are probably something like 3,000 a year, and that's about all we make a year. So we're mm. just going hand to mouth, hand to mouth, hand to mouth, looking after the money carefully, like everybody, all the other little cricket clubs do. Um, but um, we, the first the first instance we got was they, they were going to cost us 90 if we get somebody in they got contractors in to have a look at it they said 92,000 pounds to get it put right mm. which I knew we couldn't afford and I, and I couldn't see anyone dipping in the pocket to help us with that because why we're a little club it might happen again what's what's, what's the point there's, there's other clubs that could have that money and you know some of the bigger clubs seem to get a little bit more of the money we, you, you always think they do but in this case, no, the ECB and YCB came through and uh, I, we're talking with our lads. He just said, look, Keith, whatever it takes, we're going to do. We're going to help you out. And they were true to the word. I, re I managed, I realised we need to do the book. So I took the job on personally to uh, to run it, to engineer it, uh, to a lot, to a, most of the work. And COVID kicked in, so I couldn't even get the help of the lads. Um, so we had to myself uh, to carry it on. So I just got, I was hired a digger, hired a dumper, and and stuck to it. Started the digging out digging out process. Started even clearing the field with the with a digger. So I got very handy with a digger. It, it was uh, it was a good learning curve, and I enjoyed it. I mean, new to you, is oh, it? Sorry, quite new the to digging. you, diggers and oh. dumpers and whatever. Brickwork, yeah, using the digger was, yeah, yeah, using the digger, yeah, because you had to be quite skilled at that, um, very quickly because you can do a lot of damage with a digger on a cricket field, yeah. So you just got to be, uh, I wouldn't let anyone else who, who wasn't used to do it do it other than me because I knew I'd take the time and the care, and it's just like handling your own baby, you do it far more careful than anybody else will, yeah. So yeah. we did, we did all that lot, got it done. Uh, got it under well under budget, and and ECB like I said it kicked in with the money and the funds and they backed us all the way, and we got it we've got it done we've got the walls in place now uh, we're virtually back I've only got a couple of jobs to finish 
uh, I had all that work done. The, the, the aim was to get it done before the start of the season, which was looking to be half a season, starting in the back end of July. And I got all the groundwork done and I got the wall finished, sufficiently so that we could actually play on the ground. Um, but then with the, with the COVID kicked in and the rules and regulations and everything that we had to do, it was, it was probably, the, it just brought the camels back, did that. The straw that brought the camels back, it, it just, it was too much, I think. So we made a decision not to play on the ground and to invest in the, in the groundwork and do some additional stuff that wouldn't help it. So take a season out just to give us a breathing space so that we can move into the following season. Yeah. Well, better. Yeah. More, more ready. So that's, that's what we've done and that's where we're at. And at the mo moment in time, everything's on course. And let's hope that with this COVID that we do get some cricket in next year and we can play a pretty much normal uh, season. Mm. So that's, that's where we're at at the moment. In, in, in a far better place than we were this uh, or February last year. It's so, really great stuff, mate. Thank you for that. On to some, just a few questions now. Um, with a history of flooding, what advice could you pass on to other groundsmen that may be new to flooding? It would depend on the type of flooding you get. If it's just water, most of the time I say don't worry about it. It'll alleviate itself. It, it'll drain. Your drains will kick in. If you, if if it's a one-off and you're a, you're isolated and you don't have drains that, that that can kick kick in to clear that amount of drain, obviously you're going to, have to drain it yourself. You know, get pumps in, pump it out into wherever it came onto a lower spot, into a drain or whatever. Uh, if you've been contaminated um, with silt and sand and debris and things like that, clear it as fast as you can. As soon as you get the chance, clear it. Uh, don't wait too long. If you've got sand and silt on your square, attack that first. Because the silt that comes out of the rivers is such that when it dries, it's a bit like clay. You can't shift it, you can't move it. Right. So you've got to squeegee it off nice and carefully into lines, get it into lines that you can manage, get it into lines that are off your square and into, into rows. And then as it semi-solidifies, you can lift it. Don't wait till it goes rock hard, just mm. get, to get it in the semi-sludge stage. So it's actually, it'll stay on your shovels, it'll stay on whatever you're lifting it up with, get snow shovels or anything like that, that you lift it out and get it off the field, get it out of the way. It's a, it's a horrible thing. The outfield, attack that as best you can, same, same system, get it into roles. Work as teams, work in an organised fashion. So you're not all scattered all over the place, attack one zone at a time, Work on it, get everyone in a line, working together, and get, get one row, move on to the next row, get another row. So you've got all lines. So when it dries and semi-solidifies, semi you've got somewhere you can just move in with your, your, your jumper. If the ground's firm enough, we use a tract, we use actually use a, a tract skip because it spreads away a great deal better and yeah. leaves less, less, less dint in the floor. So we use, a, it was quite a big tract skip, Try put that inside your uh, in, inside your in between your uh, uh, mounds of earth and the, and the trenches that you've, the um, lines that you've made of the debris and the sludge and that lot, and then you can work on either side throwing it in, and you're only going on there once. You're not going all over the place. You, you, you're using it minimalistically and, and mm. using it on the ground as little as possible. Track it off, get it out of the way. Once you start if, it, if it's during the season then you're, you're you're really struggling if it's prior to season you've got a little bit more chance you can let things dry out you can have a bit more time to work on it once you get it off the square though what you tend to end up with is, is a very thin layer of silt because you've squeezed it off yeah but it'll all you never get it all yeah. you never get it all so what I found over like over the over the years is that you can get what, what we could call layering or plating, where every year you top dress. Mm -hmm. So you put that dressing on top, but if you've got this little thin layer, it fails to pop, properly bond with with this layer below. 
So as you go through the years, that layer is still there. And it might be 10, 15 centimetres down, which is in the root zone. So what happens is the roots li like to grow it and, and it'll follow the path of least resistance. They go down and then go along this little plate. <clears throat> and you don't notice it until you start heavy rolling because what you get, you can get little bubbles. So the plates are like that. And then you heavy rolling, it's a bit like rolling pizza. It wants to go wider, but it can't go wider because it's got nowhere to go. So what it does, it pops. And it just pops like that. And you see these little mounds and you wonder what the blooming neck they are. And you can, you can pop them and it's just air really, but it, it, mainly it's just the fact that it's just got nowhere to go. It, so it's popped up. So you, you, you've really got to get rid of that silt. So the way to get to prevent that really is plenty of brushing, verticutting, scarifying, yeah, and, and, and just get that little top layer off. You know, you'd, 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 cut into the surface a little bit, couldn't you? With the vertical, cut into the surface, you know, give it something to become a bond with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Net, you can yeah aerate it, it, spike it. Yeah, all those things are good. They'll, they'll help prevent it and, and stop that. Because, uh, I mean, I've been doing this, what, 35 years. So, and <laughs> taking core samples, you can see you can see what's happening during those years. Mm -hmm. uh, and we did a couple of core samples and they could see these little black lines. And I'm fairly certain they'll, they'll coincide with flood periods of a flood. Mm -hmm. So we generally get one good flood every three years. And you can see these little black lines that the telltale signs of the history of the ground, where probably grounds from before me, or even me, has failed to uh, realise that there's that little layer there and hasn't done enough sufficient scarifying and drilling or vertical or anything like that to get rid of it. And spike through it's probably quite a good solution as well, isn't it? You know, good yes. air in the winter to try and get the roots to go through them layers and key it all Good together. spiking, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. We've had uh, a good... We had to get it serious to get, to get rid of that problem. So I had the square drilled and I'll, I'll have it done again soon. Yeah. But it, the drilling process goes quite deep and it just creates these positions and it's very, very, it's, it's comprehensive. The, the, the drills are very tight, close together and it does every single thing. It's like a giant box if you've seen one. Yeah, yeah. It's like a, <clears throat> then just drill straight in the ground and the reverse drill back out. So you've got no, you're not hollow core, you're not, you've got no pull out. All you've got is a drill in and drill out. So it, you don't see any difference. There's no pull on but the surface, it's, it's just clean, yeah. Mm. But what but the roots can find it and the roots will just will, will go down those little drills and they'll tie it all together again so you don't get that popping. And that's what you want because we, we do a hell of a lot of rolling as groundsmen, don't we? So we don't want anything popping up and we don't want an uneven surface, do you? So Plenty. yeah, those are, that's the main that, that's probably one of the worst dangers of the uh, of the flooding, the silt. It's really vital stuff that. Um now, I'm assuming you, you've probably got quite limited a range of machinery. How do you do with machinery? How do you source that? Have you, got, you found any within <clears throat> routes or you got, you know, or have you just from within the club? How, how, how are you for machinery sort of saying sustainable? Oh. sustainable? Going through the years, I mean, when I first took over in probably about, about 84, I think it was. Machinery was limit, very limited. We didn't have a, we didn't have a mecha, mechanized roller. So you, the, the tracks only got rolled just before the match. You know, you had six lads on, on, a, on a roller rolling it up and down, you know, once before match and usually after match. Uh, as far as machinery, I just had, I had one, I had one outfield mower, a 30 inch ACCO groundsman, which I kept, kept going for a long, 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 long time. And I used to even cut this, the, the square with that. I used to cut a track with it and it was quite acceptable. It wasn't brilliant, but it was acceptable. Uh, and then you move on and you, you, you get a few, few quid together, you're going to look for a little bit more machinery. You, you realise you need a mechanised roller. <clears throat> so you do anything you can to get older one. You get, you're always looking at second hand gear and more, most, most little clubs like us are. Uh, you've got friends and we're in the right areas. You've, you've got to utilise those areas where you can. Friends, mates, Friends of friends, or oh, well, I know someone's getting rid of this. I'll have that. Oh yeah, I can have that. Yeah, 
little money changes hands, but you do a lot of favours for folk, don't you? Uh, but over the years, uh, I've managed to save up a little bit of money. We put, we put in place systems to bring in money, like sponsor boards, advertising boards, which is useful for us because we're very ne right next to and overlooked by the main the main road. So people can look over and they see them. So it's nice to have them boards and they, they appreciate the fact that, you know, someone's actually sponsoring a little cricket club. <clears throat> um, we own some land opposite, which we put allotments on. So we get rent from those. Uh, then we used to have the, 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 what we used to call the 500 club, which is like a, a bit like a bonus ball system. Before, long before the bonus ball thing came in, we had this 500 club. That used to bring in a little bit of money. You, know, you, get, you do your match ball sponsors for all your matches. It's all the little things that add up. But uh, yeah, over the years, we've sort of like managed to save up. And after the 2015 Boxing Day flu, we lost all our equipment because the tackle shed was actually under water, below the water line. So I had like, they were three foot below water. Um, oh. So the ECB looked after us then. Right. Uh, and they, they, they sorted out with some new equipment, brand new equipment. It was like Christmas come early for me. Brand new outfield mower, brand new wicket mower, uh, new roller. So I had I had all the I had all the tools for the trade then, and uh, it made my life so much easier. Yeah, I mean, I used to go to the shed and wonder if the thing if the machines were actually going to start working or not. But you know, you had to, you had to mess with them for half an hour just to coax them into a bit of life to last long enough to do the job you want to do, and then put them away and just hope they work next time. Mm. So, and that's pretty much the same for most groundsmen, really. You've got to look after your equipment, regular maintenance, make it so they don't break down so often. Oil your chains up, all the obvious things. Oil your chains up, keep everything lubricated. Change your oil in your machines once it won't end the season work, which most people do. But all those little things do help because no one, no groundsman likes it. It's not, nothing worse than coming up to your machine to do a last cut the morning of the match and you can't get your mower going or a chain snapped or something like that. And you think, oh, crack, this is not good, you know, because got, you've got another 21 lads waiting on you to 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 prep something for Andal to play cricket on and, uh, and you're struggling with a busted chain. So... I think you, 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 most groundsmen are uh, quite handy. They generally tend to be the more handier type of blow. They're, they're very positive and very uh, obviously outgoing, like being outside. Uh, but they're good rounds and got a good mechanical base. They're, good, they're, they're the know-how people. They tend to work out how to do things. Give them a problem, they'll sort it out. That, them's the sort of guys who are groundsmen usually. Yeah. So... Uh, but obviously do everything you can to make your, like, your own life easier don't wait for it to break lubricate it you know just keeping it, clean, it. You know, yeah. around it getting a feel for the machine you know. understanding the machines yeah I mean I could take I could take the engine off my out, my outfield mower and put a brand new one on it in, 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 in no time you know I could change a clutch I could strip the clutch down put new clutch plates in it in the, in the morning you know all silly jobs that a lot of people wouldn't attempt but groundsmen are the sort that will and do, and it saves you a lot of money. So be good at your job, but also you've got to be a mechanic and, or in my case, a plumber or an electrician or whatever else. Because I think <laughs> a lot of groundsmen, again, they, they, they're multi-talented because they don't just do grounds. Because if someone does his ground, he obviously loves the place. So if another job becomes what requires doing, they'll go and do that. If it's building a wall, if it's changing, you know, a light bulb, if it's rewiring the electricity system, they'll, they'll have a go, you know. So they're a, they're a good bunch. You take me out of for to them all. Um, right. Thank you for that. The last question is because, well, it's probably quite obvious, but you spend so much time next to next to your house or the ground. Why do you do it? And how would you? Why would? What would you say to it that would encourage other people that were considering doing it who might be watching this? You know, and they're looking for something doing their retirement or they're they're young and they want to give something back. I, yeah, so just some, something there, really. Um, it's a difficult, really. I suppose I, I, I moved into this area when I was one. I, I moved. I actually lived next door to where I live now. So I, I was, I was, I wasn't next door. I was one door away from the cricket ground, uh, and obviously. 
lads play cricket on there all the time. So I grew up, we've seen him practice and things like that. And then I eventually went going on cricket field and I used to do a lot of fielding for him whilst he was practicing there. The open net on the field, cracking the ball to the other end of the field. So I'd go running after it and then throwing it back. And then it ended say, oh, hey, little lad, come here. Get some pads on you. You can have a little bat now for bringing ball back. So I did that and I had the pads up to my chest here and they're not much different now, actually, to be honest. I'm only sure, lad. But uh, that got me into it. I started playing. Um, I've got, I've been about 2022 or something like that when I first started getting to, they lost the groundsman. They tried a few other lads. And nothing seemed to work. No one seemed to last. No one seemed to know what they were doing. We were in a bad way. And I just went to one of the meetings and I said, look, I'll, I'll give it a go. I yeah. says, I've never done it before. I says, but I can read. I can learn. I can I understand. I learn fast. I'll give it a shot. So, and another lad, Peter Brennan, but, uh, older than me, said he'd, he'd also give it a shot. And he'd, but he didn't want to be in charge. He just wanted to, he just wanted something to do with, tell him what to do. And then he'd do it. And, me and Peter, we were together for, I think he was with me for 20 years. He passed away last year, unfortunately. But he was with me for 20 years and, uh, and we really turned it round. We, um, we, we we did a lot of work. I think the, the day after the day after I got married, I was at Headingley on a groundsman's course with Keith Boyce. Yeah. So well, that was my honeymoon. And uh, and to be honest, I, did, I, I didn't learn a great deal. But what I did learn was that what I was doing was pretty much close to what I needed to do. Mm. So it gave me an affirmation that what we do was right, which is good, and had a good thing to build on. I think the problem with a lot of uh, new groundsmen is that you can spend a lot of time doing something wrong before you do it right. Um, so take advice of others that have done it for any length of time, read, understand what makes grass grow, understand what kills grass, uh, do the work to make the game a better game, but then you've also got to do the make, work, work to make the, the ground a good ground and, and recover and, and, and the reverse work. So you're doing, you're doing one thing to create the track and then you've got to undo it all to let, to let it live and survive again. <clears throat> you can't concentrate in just one area. You can't just say, right, I'm going to roll and roll and roll and roll and, roll and not do any of the undo work. You've got to do the undo work. Yeah. Otherwise, you've, you've no longevity. You've no return. You've no cycle. It is a cycle. You've got to keep turning it round and round and round. Get, get it just to keep it going. So I think a lot of new groundsmen tend to concentrate on one wrong area, get things wrong to start with. Uh, so listening to others that know, listen to someone that's prepared to talk to you, yeah. uh, give you the benefit of their advice, and most groundsmen will, you know, they'll all know some, but they'll know somebody in their league that's been there, oh, I'll go and talk to old Jack because he's been doing it for about 20 yeah. years now. Yeah. I've got a problem. I'll ask him, I'll bend his ear, and you can bet your bottom dollar that he'll listen and he'll tell you. And he won't bother him either in him because he wants you, he loves the game of cricket like everyone else does, and he'll want you to do the same at your place. Yeah. So, yeah, so I always listen to others. It's, it's like all the skills in the world that, die when the when the skilled joiner the skilled builder goes if he hasn't passed those skills on to somebody else then that skill dies so yeah. it, it has to go it's just like it's just another cycle that has mm. to go around so yeah listen uh, and do your prep work and, and and do your maintenance work is, is the best thing i can say for, for an up and coming groundsman why they want to do a groundsman um that is a difficult one I know I didn't want my son to be a groundsman, particularly, uh, because I am a groundsman, but I'm not an idiot. I know it's a, it is a bit of a mugs game. You know, you, 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 you won't get the help you want. You won't get the foot finance you want. You won't get the, the backing you want. Uh, you'll get plenty of people slagging you off because you haven't done the track the way they want it. Yeah. So you've got to be fairly hard-faced and stubborn uh, and not care too much about what, others say, listen to them, take it on board, evaluate it, and then do what you want to do. Do what you believe in. Because trying to do something that you're, trying to be something that you're not is, 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 a, is a mugs game. You'll find out if, you, if, 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 you, if you're meant to be a groundsman, you'll pretty much soon find out whether you are. 
you've got to take a lot of flack and you'll, you'll get a lot of lads will do it for a few years and then they'll just chuck you in because if someone said something to them, oh, so-and-so says my trap's crap and they, but, yeah, well, he's just been giving out LBW to, to, to you know, he's a full bloody Yorker and he's, and he's upset, you know. So you've got to, you've got to have a broad back. So, but it is enjoyable. It gets you outside. You've got to be an outdoors person. Sun does not always shine on a groundsman. The work doesn't always want doing when you've got the time to do it mm. or when the weather's right you've got a box clever you've got to be you've got to be, you're working with the weather you've got to work with the conditions with the funding you've got with the amount of help you've got you've got to hope that the rain, the rain stays off when you want it to stay off you hope the sun shines when you want it to shine and you know you've got all these things and you, you you can do a lot of work to get a game on Prep a game for two weeks, prep a track for two weeks, and then all of a sudden it all goes to pay ship and you don't get anything. But you've done all the work, you're just not going to get paid for it. <laughs> and payment's another issue, because most groundsmen don't get paid. You know, uh, I don't draw a penny for what I've done in, like I say, like the last 35 years. So you don't do it for the money. Professionals probably will, you know, and they'll love it. Um, but normal grassroots groundsman like me, a little tiddly little club like this, we'll get paid, we'll get thanked. I can't remember the last time my lad said, oh, thanks, Keith, that was right. nice track, that or I think they all know it, you know, and I have to, I have to understand, I have to believe they all know it and they have to believe that they all like the fact that it's all done. And it, you know, I'm sure some days they turn up and they think that fairies have been here. And it, well, it was like that last time we came, so it, it's like that this week we came, so it must be, you know, it must ever change. Grass mm. don't grow, grass don't need cutting, tracks don't need rolling, benches don't need painting, you know, boundaries don't need marking, you know, because they're always like that. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of, there is a lot of that, so you've got to suffer a lot of fools. Not everybody in cricket puts, not everybody in cricket or sport puts, puts enough back in to warrant their own participation, never mind anybody else's, you know. If I had, if I could encourage anyone to put, do, if you're one eleventh of a team, make sure you at least do one eleventh of the work, yeah? Or if you can't do that, at least buy the, buy the groundsman a pint after the match. Because, uh, you know, you've got to, you've got to give a bit back Hello. somewhere. Right? Mm -hmm. That's so, yeah, it's a nice job. Don't get me wrong. It's nice. Mm -hmm. and it gets, it gets more difficult. The more you, the better you make something, the more you've got to maintain it. So, you know, yeah. you, you, you get, the, mm. yeah, you get something back, but it's not something that you can actually put a financial figure on, definitely. Uh, but you'll learn to like it or you'll learn to loathe it. Um, so, in, yeah, yeah in the, 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 that's the difference between a groundsman and not a groundsman, I think. A groundsman just likes doing it. So, mm -hmm. so, but I, I can't. I, I've loved it all my life, and I love where I live, and I love, I love looking back. And you know, my my mate, my old mate Peter Brennan, that we've been for twenty years. We used to meet her down here on a Friday afternoon. He'd do the outfield. I'd look up. I look predominantly at the square, get that ready and prepped for the next for the next day's game. And uh, we'd walk off the field at tea time, and we'd walk up onto the road where his car were, and we'd look, we'd overlook the ground, and he'd, he'd just say. Ready, and that were it. That's what he got out of it. Mm. You know, I knew from that phrase. I knew he looked. He looked over it, and he said he knew he loved it. He loved the look of it. I've done mm. something. I've prepped something for somebody else. Mm. You know, there nothing, no, there's, you, there's no selfishness about a groundsman. You're doing it for a lot of other people, not for yourself, not for the congratulations you're going to get, not for the thanks. It's because maybe because you want to do it and you want to do it for everybody else. And you want everybody else to enjoy it. And I get I get a lot out of the, uh, not just the players enjoy it. Moreover, so now that the the spectators, because it's such a beautiful ground now, that they, they come down and they seek us out. And my, my partner Sharon, who's been with me for about eight years now, she just puts the icing on my cake because she's she likes the flowers, and they, they, they're, they're dotted everywhere. So it's regularly 3,000 plants around our ground and, and, and we've had uh, accolades from Yorkshire, from Todd in Bloom. We've got a gold of Yorkshire in Bloom and they do not like giving golds away, I can tell you that now. <laughs> they get, we got a gold from Yorkshire in Bloom, which is absolutely brilliant. So that's smashing for a little cricket club. 
Mm. And, and the lads at York, the lads at Yorkshire appreciate it. They've been down here. All, all, all the main boys come down and have a look, and they, oh, Keith, oh, lovely ground. But best, one of the best in Yorkshire. Yeah, uh, and I like to think it's one of the best in country. And uh, and, I, and I've been around a few grounds, and I think I think I think a lot of cricket grounds could do with putting a few more flowers around for definite. It's not yeah. just. Uh, <clears throat> great, Keith. That's really good. <laughs> Great, great stuff, Keith. Really, really inspiring stuff there. I think you're a real credit to your club and and to the gra grassroots groundsmen, really. Um, yeah, thanks for that. And um, yeah, stay safe and um, I'll catch up with you again some other time. Great, Brian. Thanks, thanks for having me. It's been uh, been nice to chat to you, mate. Okay.